We are excited, as always, to be here on a regular basis to showcase some of the uh, fantastic programs uh, that we have at, in Utah State in terms of our research programs. We have a very unusual program for you today, one that we are very excited about, not only for the, the quality and, and characteristics that it delivers to our, our, our training programs uh, at the university, but the fact that it represents across the entire state, indeed in the entire country, a very important sector, a financial sector in terms of, of uh, growth and expansion, and, and that is in, in the arts uh, and entertainment district. I'd like to start, as we usually do, recognizing the fact that this program would not be possible without the generous support of Regents Insurance. I'm very pleased to have Miguel Rivera here representing Regents. Miguel, as always, thank you so much for your patronage and support. In the arts, when you are, are training individuals, you're helping them to, to create a situation where all of us attending a program can suspend our disbelief and, and absorb ourselves into the moment uh, and appreciate that, that creative expression. And uh, our arts program under the leadership of, of Dean Craig Jessup is, does exactly that. Craig, I'd like to recognize you for your leadership in, in the arts. Thank you. To introduce our, our speaker, I'm very pleased to welcome to, to, the, uh, to the mic our president, President Albrecht. Stand. Thank you, Mark. And let me uh, join Mark in thanking you for joining us on this uh, beautiful winter morning. Uh, again, my thanks to Regents. Uh, Miguel has become not only a colleague, but a good friend. And Miguel, thank you for your support. We appreciate that. And uh, Bob Hatch. Bob is a uh, former CEO, member of the board. Uh, love working with him. It's good to have you here. Appreciate you joining us. And any other folks from Regents. But uh, as, as Mark indicated, their support has been absolutely critical, essential to what it is that, that we're doing. Let me uh, just remind you that we will have a spring sunrise session on April 18th, and at that time we'll hear from Susanna French from the USU College of Science. Uh, let me just say a little bit about that, because uh, we have at Utah State University right now 15 active National Science Foundation career award winners. It's extraordinarily unusual for an institution of our size to have this number of National Science Foundation career award winners, and uh, Susanna French is the newest of these. Uh, she was just designated as an NSF Career Award winner a short time ago. She'll be speaking on how animals are responding to the changing U Utah climate. And uh, I know you'll find this very fascinating. Whenever I see a picture of her, she's got lizards or snakes or other things surrounding her. And uh, I don't know if she'll do some show and tell, but uh, look forward to that. It should be, a, should be a fun morning. As we have done these sunrise sessions with Regents' support over the years, as those of you who are regular tenders will understand, we've focused in significant part on, on the sciences, on engineering, on some of the, the exciting uh, intellectual property that's being developed by our faculty. We've talked a lot about commercialization of projects. And yet, I think it's important for everyone to understand that the, the excellence that is Utah State University extends not just across the sciences, engineering, the typical STEM disciplines, but extends as well into the arts. And as Mark indicated, we're, we're honored to have leading that uh, college on the fine arts side, Dean Craig Jessup, doing an outstanding job for us. But in addition to a, to a really strong dean, we've been able to put together an outstanding faculty. And it's really the quality of that faculty that creates the, the kind of experience that we like to have for our students. I think it was, maybe it was you, Craig, who said to me one day, uh, we don't study the arts for a living, but we study arts for life. And uh, it really does affect the quality of our lives. And so for our students, really providing that broad liberal education is very, very important of what we're attempting to do. So let me just quickly introduce our, our speaker this morning, Sean Fisher. Sean has been a designer, playwright, producer, director, craftsman, 
over a hundred different shows uh, across the country. He is founder and director of the National Playwright Symposium at Cape May Stage, where he hosts Pulitzer and Tony Award winning Broadway playwrights as they mentor young and emerging scholars and artists. Sean is the founding director of the Fusion Theater Project, which is a non-traditional company that is based at USU and creates original works of social themed theater. He is an Edgerton Foundation New American Play Award winner and in 2012 was selected as the Utah State University Creative Artist of the Year. Professor Fisher believes, as we all believe, that artistic expression is truly the core to being a human. So let me ask you to join me in welcoming Professor Fisher. Thank you so much. Uh, this is really a, a special occasion for me. I, I'm thrilled to be here uh, on behalf of, of my fellow artists, because I believe this is the first time we've had an artist uh, speak at the Sunrise Session, uh, as far as I know. And so when I found out that I would be uh, participating in this, frankly, I was a bit nervous when I was reading the list of great accomplishments of the engineers and the scientists and the business people who had been coming to this. And I said, ah, why do they want to hear stories of a, of a guy who puts on plays for a living? Um, and then I figured out, ah, you know, what the heck, we, we put on plays for fun, so I'll try to make it as fun and as interesting as possible. Um, one thing that I wanted to, uh, to mention before I got started is we often look at the arts as uh, a bit of recreation, as a bit of frivolity, if you will. Uh, but I found a very interesting statistic recently when I was researching for this. The arts and entertainment industry in the United States makes up 4% of our entire GDP. The entire U.S. government makes up 5%. So this is a huge, massive industry. So not only is this something that matters to us personally, and as, as Dean Jessup has said, it gives us something to live for, but it also, in fact, does provide a living for many, many, many thousands of people. And Utah is, is really, uh, has been really successful in these areas. The arts are so critical uh, in the state of Utah, in the film industry, and the theater, and music, and dance industries. It's really a wonderful place where the arts thrive. So, uh, so I'm thrilled to be here talking about it. This is a picture of me in 1978 in elementary school in New Jersey. I'm from the Jersey Shore. I don't know if anyone's ever seen the show, The Jersey Shore. Those are my people. <laughs> as you can see, this, uh, this day was very important, as is evident from the clothes that I'm wearing. I have my favorite number 12 t-shirt on, my best cowboy belt buckle, with, uh, you can't really tell, but it's got a steer's head there, and it was much too big for me. And my finest pair of bright red pants. <laughs> Clearly this was an important day, photo day, but even more so because our teacher had very, very high standards. Her name was Mrs. Bruner. She was very intimidating. Even her name was intimidating. Mrs. Bruner sounds like the, the villain in every children's book I ever read. This is her. I feared this woman. So one day while in, in the middle of teaching a lesson, she suddenly went silent. This was not a good thing. Because the, there was one thing that we feared more than her loud booming voice, and that was her silence, because it meant someone in the room had done something wrong. And until she established who that was, we were all suspect. <laughs> Unfortunately, on this day, it was me. I was the guilty party. While she was teaching her lesson, I was sitting there in my workbook, drawing little pictures and telling little stories all over my school-appointed uh, uh, textbook. This was a very bad thing. She said, Mr. Fisher, she called us by her last name, I think it's just to make her more intimidating. She said, Mr. Fisher, during recess, I want you to stay inside. I need to talk to you. Now, this is about the worst thing she could possibly say. I would have been less scared if she had kicked over a chair and thrown a stapler at me. 
But instead, she wanted to talk to me alone, which meant my punishment was going to be so severe that she had to avert the eyes of the rest of the class. This is not something I was looking forward to. So as the class lined up to go out to recess, they all looked over their shoulder. Might be the last time they were ever going to see me alive. They leave the building, and she says, Mr. Fisher, I say, yes, ma'am. She says, grab your workbook. So I do. Come here. I do. Sit in this desk next to mine. I do. Give me your workbook. I give her my workbook. She very slowly begins to flip through the pages, one at a time, her and me face to face. To my great dismay, the two of us both realized that I had drawn and defaced every single page in the book. <laughs> she opens a drawer and she pulls out a ruler. I knew what this meant. I take my hands, I put them under my thighs, out of reach of her weapon. She then grabs a stack of paper, and using the ruler, she begins to rip the pages. And then she layers them on top of each other, and she staples them together. And she handed me this. It was just made from old scrap pages, old uh, worksheets and whatnot, and she hands it to me and she says, Sean, you're a good artist, whatever that means at the age of eight. You're a good artist. I like your pictures and I like your stories. And any time you want to draw a picture or any time you want to tell a story, I want you to do it. Any time you want, you just have to do it in here, not in your workbook. I was shocked. I thought this was the end of my academic career. And instead, she was rewarding me not for breaking the rules, but for expressing myself. She said to me, do you know why I'm giving this to you? And I said, no. And she said, because every one of us has a thing, a thing that's worth sharing. And I guess this is yours. And she sent me out to recess. Just some of my posse out on the uh, playground. Without one act of empathy, she made me understand the importance of art of expression and of ideas. And not only did she communicate to me that it was okay to do this, she let me know that this was important, that it's something that, that could matter. And that affected me profoundly throughout my life. Now I'm in my 40s. I'm probably the same age that she was when all of this happened. I'm getting a little gray. And now I have students of my own, university students up at Utah State. But even so, as I started going through my notes in preparation for this, this is what I came across. I'm still doodling. I was working on a play, and I had a character that was kind of a big, tough guy thug, and I found myself doodling different versions of his face all over my notebook. I had an idea for another play that involved uh, a genie and a dragon, a play for young people. Those pictures started to come out on the page. I have no idea why I was drawing a house, but I just wanted to include this to demonstrate that I actually was taking notes. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't just about the pictures. Mrs. Bruner taught me something very important. This is one of my scripts, by the way. You'll notice all the notes in the margins. She taught me something important that I use every day with my students, both design and playwriting students. Sometimes the most important work can be found in the margins. It's the ideas in between the ideas that sometimes bring us to our greatest discoveries. Here's a good example. Here's another one of my pages of notes. You notice at the top, you probably can't even tell what the picture is. There's a little camper with a church steeple. And behind the camper is a little cemetery in the middle of the desert. And there, are, there were words on the page that said, setting, cemetery, Arizona desert. 
I had no idea what this was. It was just a drawing at the top of, of a page. But nevertheless, six months later, a group of students and I were on the U.S.-Mexico border at this place. This is a cemetery down in Arizona where migrants are often buried in a very modest way. Students were very interested in, in this topic, and so we went down there and we looked for the ideas in between the ideas. The students would uh, interview people. We interviewed migrant workers, American and Mexican citizens. We just grab them on the streets and ask them their thoughts. We interviewed and volunteered with humanitarians. This is a group that, uh, with the support of the US government, provides water in the desert to prevent deaths. Humanitarian groups. And we worked with activists and church members and clergy of various faiths. Here's a picture of some students who, as we were driving by part of the cemetery, they noticed that this one section had been vandalized, and they insisted that we stop the car, and they went out and tried to, to uh, bring back a little bit of dignity to this section of the cemetery. We even interviewed Border Patrol, and we had ride-alongs with police officers. Our goal was to understand every point of view we could possibly discover. We did not go in with a strong opinion as to what it was we were going to come out with. But after interviewing hundreds of people, we actually found the topics that we were exploring even more complex than we thought they were going to be. So we came back to Utah, and it led to this. This is a production. This is a, a shot from a production that we produced that all started with that doodle on the top of a page and a bunch of students sitting around my coffee table eating pizza and sharing their ideas. The play is called Do Not Hit Golf Balls Into Mexico. And yes, it is meant to be a funny title and there's a lot of comedy in the play, even though we would consider it a drama in general. That's actually a sign down in Texas on a golf course that happens to be right next to the border wall. And there's signs all over the golf course that say Do Not Hit Golf Balls Into Mexico. I thought it was hysterical and it needed to be the title of the play. It was produced on the campus of Utah State University. Starting with a blank page, these students researched, interviewed, produced, did every aspect of designing and writing and producing these uh, stories. The final play was a story about family and sacrifice, violence, hate and love, and it was all based on these interviews. These are a couple of hapless uh, truck drivers who are carrying a, a cargo that you discover late in the play is a cargo of people. But you don't realize it until after you've gotten to know them on a very comical and lighthearted level so that when we discover who they're actually hauling, it becomes a very uh, emotional moment. Although it's a work of fiction, the entire play was inspired by these stories, these interviews that we did. Everything was based on things that actually happened. And soon after, with a group of students in tow, the play, we started getting some calls, and the play ended up being staged at Salt Lake Acting Company. Hopefully some of you have been to some of their shows. We then got a call for it to be uh, staged for a couple of productions in Los Angeles at the LA Theater Center, and then eventually we got a call for uh, a reading, a staged reading, off-Broadway in New York at the Repertorio Español, which is a fantastic award-winning uh, company there in New York. And this was all on the backs of the students. The students really created this, this amazing work. And this, for many of them, was the first opportunity that they had to really emerge themselves into the professional world and work with some of the best. In New York, they were working with Broadway actors. So it was a very special experience for them. So this is what I do now. Thanks to Mrs. Bruner, I tell stories for a living. These are pictures of sets and some of the plays that I've written. And I tell stories now in two ways, design and playwriting. So let's talk a little bit about the playwriting more specifically. The word playwright is spelled W-R-I-G-H-T as opposed to W-R-I-T-E, the second half of the word at least. The difference there is it's not trying to say it is one who writes plays. It is saying it is one who crafts plays, like a ship's right who builds ships from wood, or a wheelwright who builds spoked wheels or a Wainwright, a Wainwright. Does anyone know what a Wainwright is? They build wagons, okay? 
So the name itself really tells you about what the process of a playwright is. It's about taking little pieces and putting them together and adjusting them and carving them, if you will, until finally we come up with our final version. And it's, it's an interesting coincidence that we're using the word playwright, which is very similar to the word shipwright, because one of the plays that I developed all started in a shipyard in Connecticut, a place called Mystic Seaport. I don't know if anyone's ever been there. It's a wonderful place full of tall ships. And one day, this massive tree trunk was brought into the seaport. It was going to be put on display as an, as an example of as an example of, um, thank you, <laughs> that's okay, uh, as an example of, of how ships are built. And I was looking at this tree and I was, uh, I was interested in its story and I found out that the tree had stood in South Carolina and it was knocked over by a hurricane. It was a 400 year old tree and it was sort of the symbol of this town. And as I was looking at the tree, I noticed something interesting about it. Right here was a large black scar in the trunk. Clearly it had been burned, and clearly it had been burned many, many, many years ago. And I asked, what's the story with that? And I was told that this tree actually stood on a plantation where slaves were working. And the slaves would build fires along the side of this tree. And this went on for generations. But over the hundreds of years since that happened, the tree continued to grow, and it started to, to grow around this scar and actually close off the scar. I could reach inside, and it's actually much larger than you can see in that picture. And I was fascinated by this idea of a scar that over time became deeper, but harder to see. And I was especially interested in the fact that the scar was connected to, to our country's history and, and, and uh, a really dark part of our country's history. So that really was a, a, a great inspiration, a great metaphor to explore a story. And then I sat on that for 20 years until I, I came across uh, some people who were interested and I pitched the idea and we ended up creating the play How to Make a Rope Swing, which eventually was, was produced here in um, Salt Lake City and then on the East Coast as well. Um, it features a woman named Lynn Cohen. That's her on the left. If anyone has seen the Hunger Game movies, she plays Mags, the woman that they carry around on the guy's back throughout the jungle. I don't know if anyone has seen that movie, but she's a wonderful actor. And, and she performed it. I was exploring race from a point of view that looked back through generations of change. The character of Mrs. Wright was actually inspired by my grandmother. My grandmother, who I knew as this loving, kind, generous woman, I also knew as someone who a bit too often would say statements that I wasn't particularly comfortable with, statements that were perhaps racist or not perhaps racist, that were squarely racist. But yet she was the superintendent of schools in Bridgeton, New Jersey, and she was mandated in the 50s with integrating the school system. I knew both sides of her. And she did it very well, by the way. She was very successful at this. And I was fascinated by this idea of a character who was so conflicted with who she was and what mattered to her. She loved children. She loved taking care of them, all kinds of children. But she also had these views. So that became the catalyst for this play. Race is often portrayed as black and white, good and bad, when really the best stories exist in the gray areas. It's the ideas in between the ideas, like we've been saying. But there's more to storytelling than just the words. And that's where the other side of what I do comes in. And this is where I get to throw some eye candy up on the, up on the screen, some more interesting images. As a designer, we try to create the world of the play through visual means. And sometimes, just like those doodles, it starts with a very quick and rough sketch like this. And then it evolves and changes as I collaborate with other, uh, with other artists and it becomes something very different, very real. This is a set for King Lear. I don't know if you can see it very well on that screen. It's awfully dark. 
but we wanted to create a, a space that reflected the madness that King Lear experiences. He actually goes insane during the play, and he wanders the mountainside during a violent storm. So we wanted to create a space that was sort of an abstraction of this world. And the set would change according to the different locations, but it would just change with, with modest adjustments of light and color. This is actually at Utah State University, and this fellow playing King Lear is actually a Broadway actor that we brought in for the, for the run of the show so that the students could work with him. Design is largely influenced by the space that, it will, be, that will be housing the play. I'm partial to small spaces like this one. I love the intimacy of it. I love the fact that the audience can sit right there and two feet away is part of the scenery and the actors. It forces us to be very detailed and very specific and it makes every aspect of our design vital. There is nothing that is unimportant when you have a small space. And sometimes these small sets, these minimal sets can have the most emotional impact because of this intimacy. Here's an example. This is a project that I did recently called A Walk in the Woods. I designed the set for it. A Walk in the Woods was a, was a Pulitzer-nominated uh, play from the 80s, and it was written uh, about the, uh, basically the arms race. It was a Cold, World, uh, Cold War play where you had two characters who were negotiators, one Russian and one American, and they were, trying, they were becoming friends as they were negotiating very important things about nuclear weapons and war and really things that could perhaps save the future of the world. But as the play progresses, you find out that really they are never going to make any progress because there's so much uh, politics and bureaucracy involved. So they're just so caught up in the history of this Cold War in these two countries. So I wanted to create a space that reflects this idea of ideas in between the ideas. The play only calls for a forest of trees and a park bench. So I created a space that was made entirely from shredded documents. Documents uh, from the Cold War, and it's amazing what you can find online. Um, I found hundreds of documents, many of which were redacted. You can see them here where, the, where the, uh, uh, many of the words are actually blackened out. And we created a set that looked like these documents had been put through a, uh, a shredder. And um, so when, as they're talking to each other and as this play is progressing, they're actually interweaving themselves with, uh, with these ideas and, and these Cold, World, Cold War um, bits of history. This is the actual set. So a small sp stage and a simple set can greatly contribute to the ideas and the emotional qualities of this play, while at other times a design can be quite grand and quite uh, emotional because of its size and scope. This actually was produced uh, up in Logan at the Utah Festival Opera. This is Faust. One of the great challenges of designing, especially large shows and operas, is that a group of over 50 artists have to collaborate together to make something work well together. Performers, directors, musicians. So it's my job as a designer to, to, to communicate the vision, and, and I'll tell you a little bit about how we do that. The top picture here is an example of a rendering that I would create. So this is something that's created, I created digitally on the computer that shows what I want the set to look like, and the bottom is the actual set. You can see it's not exactly the same, but it's very similar. You can see the colors have changed quite a bit. That's because we have a lighting designer who comes in and he adds his own layer to this, and he, he wanted to go in a different uh, direction in terms of the color, and that worked beautifully, I think. I then need to communicate the ideas just like an architect does, and it is almost identical to the process that an architect uses using software and drafting and, and whatnot to express every little detail right down to the bricks. Even the furniture is uh, designed specifically to the inch. 
And from the drafting, I can create what's called color paint ele elevations. These are what I hand to a, a group of artists who paint things and carve things. And this establishes what that's supposed to look like. Every detail is represented, even the books on the shelves, so that other artists can execute the vision. I then use those elements to build scale models. These are actual models that are about this big, quarter-inch scale. And it's actually the same model. It's just rearranged so that I can show the director the different moments in the play, or in, in this case, in the opera. And eventually, each idea, like in this rendering, becomes a real space. Here's the actual actors. And the grand finale, when the angel descends and takes Marguerite and saves her soul, and happy ending. Sometimes a play is so full of emotion that the scenery can actually be highly stylized. For the play Two-Headed by Julie Jensen, she's a Utah playwright, wonderful playwright. She, uh, she wrote a play that, that talks a little bit about uh, a dark history in, in this state of, of the Mount Meadows massacre of the 19th century. And it's a wonderfully written play that has had a lot of success around the world. And we produce it up at the university. And the play calls for a tree and a cellar. Uh, the door to a cellar, and that's it. And um, I wanted to do something a little bit different with the design because throughout the play they keep talking about these bones that are buried under, under the earth. So I found these bits of research. The top uh, right-hand picture there is wood, dead wood, and the bottom are bones. And you can see the similarities between the two. So I thought it might be interesting to explore a, a set that sort of touches on uh, some of these qualities. And I found this picture of this tree from this area and I just thought it felt like a person, a, a sad person. There's something about it to me that seems very human and, and very remorseful. So uh, that became a major influence. And then I found this bit of research, uh, this uh, artist who creates sculptures out of dead wood, like this beautiful horse. And I thought it might be an interesting thing to explore. And this is what we ended up creating. This is a tree that looks like a bunch of twisted dead branches. And it also looks like it's almost a hand that's kind of trying to reach down into the earth and dig up the past and dig up the history. One of the big challenges of this is the actors had to quickly climb up and down this tree wearing full dresses, and they even had to dance on top of the tree. It doesn't look possible in this picture, but it was. We also used projections behind it that changed throughout the play to create different moods and different uh, uh, moments in their history. And this is how we actually did it. We first created what we called the shrimp. That's that up there. Out of steel. Looks like a shrimp, but it's just the spine of the tree. This is all done with welding. We do a lot of technology in theater, and, and welding is, uh, it has actually replaced a lot of things that we used to just do with hammers and nails. And then bit by bit, we would, we would drive up the canyon, Logan Canyon, and we would harvest dead trees. All of them were already dead and dried out. And we would very carefully pick each tree based on its shape so that it would eventually end up with the shape that we wanted for the final, uh, for the final tree on stage. And here's one of the moments where she's dancing on top of the tree. It was really beautiful once the lighting designer got in there and did his magic. So when we create theater, it's about connecting with the audience. It's about figuring out ways that the ideas in the literature can be uh, shared with the audience and can make an impact. The question is, how do we do that when, when an audience Everyone in the audience has a different perspective on the world. They have a different understanding of things. So when we're creating something, whether it be a play that we're writing or whether it be something that we're designing, we're trying to appeal to something that's a little less obvious. How do we make these connections? I'm going to give you an example of something that I find fascinating. It's actually from a film. Have you ever heard of a little, uh, little known indie film called Star Wars? Anyone ever heard of it? Go see it. Rent it on VHS. <laughs> Who's the bad guy in Star Wars? 
Darth Vader. And who does he work for? Anybody know? The Empire, right? The Emperor or the Empire? He works for the Empire. This is the symbol that they use throughout the film representing the Empire. Does it evoke anything from our history? It's this evil empire. Can anyone think of an empire that Americans perhaps can connect to in the past hundred years that we associate with evil? Notice the similarities. So the creators of Star Wars decided we don't want to make a movie about Nazis. It's basically just a space western is all it is. Instead of riding horses, they're in spaceships. Instead of uh, shooting six shooters, they're shooting laser guns. But it's basically a Western. But they wanted to tap into some of these images that they knew the audience would respond to, even if they didn't realize they were responding to it. This is a propaganda poster from World War II. He is watching you. I wonder who they're talking about. You can see the similarities. There's a picture of uh, Darth Vader arriving at his film premiere with his stormtroopers. It is actually from a film premiere. But you'll notice the similarities in style. In Star Wars, they liked to inspect the troops in a large parade ground, which was something that the Nazis were famous for. Even the Imperial commanders in Star Wars pretty much stole their costumes from the Nazis. The one on the left is a Nazi uniform, and the one on the right is a uniform from the film Star Wars. You see that they're almost identical. Who would have worn this? Does anyone know? Look at the symbol. The SS. What was the other name for the SS? The Gestapo, but in this case, they were also called stormtroopers. During World War II, the SS were referred to in English as stormtroopers, which is where Star Wars got the name stormtroopers from. But not everyone in Star Wars is a bad guy. We also have the good guys. Who are these guys? The Jedis. And if you look at their clothes, can you tell, perhaps, who might have influenced their costumes? <laughs> Look at the costumes. They're almost identical. So this is an example of tapping the things that are familiar to us, which is something that we do as artists all the time. There's a tradition in theater that at the end of every rehearsal, each night, we put a single light bulb on stage. It's called a ghost light. And the, the, the superstition says that this ghost light will either keep the ghosts out or it will give them the light they need to put on their own play during the night. In either case, it's to prevent the ghosts of the theater from creating mischief for the actors and for the directors and for all of the other artists. So for my last uh, bit here, in closing, I'm actually going to read a little bit of a, of a script. I hope you don't mind. It's a monologue from uh, How to Make a Rope Swing, and it's a monologue about a light bulb. But uh, hopefully you will see that in between the ideas are the real ideas uh, of what this play is about. The character is Bo, and he's the main character in the play How to Make a Rope Swing. Excuse me, I'm not an actor, so I'll do my best. I always wanted to be where she was, keep her close. I was afraid she'd come to her senses and realize that she's too good for me. So after she come here after three days, they let me switch buildings. I don't know what she was thinking, marrying a man like me. She college educated with a real important job, and I convinced her that a handyman would make a good husband. Who you going to pay to fix the plumbing, I said. And when a doorknob come loose, who you going to pay to fix it on a teacher's salary from over at the colored school? Again and again, she turned me down, till one day, she come up to me and say she got a problem. She said a light bulb in the kitchen stopped working, and could I come over and fix it? So I do. 
It just wasn't screwed in tight enough is all. So I fixed it. But I make it look real hard. <laughs> Get out all my tools, lay them out on the table, spend a half hour on that loose light bulb. And to thank me, she offered me some cake, some good cake too. So I go into the bathroom to wash my hands. I got to make a good impression and clean hands as part of that. So while I'm in there, I make sure she can't hear nothing. And I loosen up the drain pipe under the sink. <laughs> yep. Just a little bit, so it drip, drip, drip. Guess what happens the next day? Bo, could you come over and fix my sink? Sure thing, Miss Marion. I, I think I could find some time to do that for you, so long as you got some more of that fine cake. Then you know what happened? The next day, the hinge on the cabinet come loose. <laughs> then it's a floorboard, then it's a door latch. Bo, I think my whole house is falling apart. Can you come over again? See, I was smart, right? I had her right where I wanted her. She needed me to be around so I convinced her to marry me. I didn't find out to our wedding night when she confessed. She knew it all along. <laughs> she knew it was me messing up those things. Shoot, she played me the whole time. Then you know what she told me? She told me she had went and loosened up that light bulb in the first place. <laughs> Believe that? That right there, that's the kind of woman you want to marry. Thanks. Uh, so if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them now. No? Oh, thank you. Yes, sir. Sean, the, the imagery that you showed between Star Wars and, yeah. uh, and the Nazi imagery is, is striking. But I'm, I'm wondering how much of the target audience for Star Wars would have had that historical context because they didn't grow up during that, that era. Sure, that. sure. Uh, you know, the, the reality of it is Star Wars was not and has not only been appealing for, for the children. When I first saw it, I was pretty young. But the theater was also full of many, many adults as well. So all I can do is speculate. Um, they clearly were making these choices. Whether or not it was working for children, I don't know. But it certainly was working for at least a, a good portion of the audience. I mean, it has turned into a cultural phenomenon that um, there are people who list their religion as Jedi. You know, that, that's how big it has become. So clearly, it has made some kind of impact. But uh, you're probably right. I would think the youngest children probably did not get it. You know, but Darth Vader's scary enough as it is. So there are actually other details that I didn't talk about just because of time. They also used samurai imagery. They used uh, monster imagery like uh, skeletons and, and whatnot. Darth Vader is basically a robotic skeleton face with a Nazi slash samurai helmet. You know, so they really tried to mix a whole bunch of things. So hopefully it worked for everyone. Any other questions? Yes. So what's the next play you want to make? Um, as, a, as a writer or as a designer? As a writer, um, I actually have two plays in the works right now. We produced a play last spring that was originally called uh, The Woodpecker King of Tacconi. Uh, we produced it on the campus of USU. And I'm actually rewriting it for a smaller cast for professional production. And it's getting renamed to Streetlight Woodpecker. And it, it takes place in, in Philadelphia and it deals with a, a, a returning veteran who is sort of, simply put, he's a, a damaged soul. Both, and a, he's physically damaged and he's also emotionally damaged. And, and so I'm, I'm working on that play right now. And uh, there's a second play that I'm working on, which is called uh, The Dock House, which takes place on a, in a shack and on a dock. Um, my plays tend to be set in the sort of South Jersey coastal area or the Philadelphia area where I grew up, and, and uh, just because that's how I talk, so it's easier for me to write characters that talk that way. I have to work really hard not to sound like a, you know, a South Jersey hillbilly, if you will. Um, uh, but yeah, so, so those are a couple of the plays that I'm working on now that are pretty important to me. Is there a play in right now? No. Not that I've written, no. Um, but there will be again. I mean, it, this is uh, um, my group, the Fusion Theater Project, produces plays on a regular basis. 
And um, I'm hoping within the next um, year or so to have another play get staged. Um, I know Dean Jessup has seen some. And two, did you? Oh, uh, Henrik Rebsing, right, okay. Oh, good. Thank you. Sure. I'd love to know we're told about this Okay, I'll inquire about how to get that word out. That'd be great. I, I, I love having bigger audiences, you know? That's wonderful. Thank you. Yes, sir. You talked about voice and dialect and dialogue. Um, I just wondered uh, if you could comment a little bit on the language of Utah. Uh, it's hard for us to, to hear it. Yeah. Because we're in it. Yeah. And I know that it's changed a lot. It's changed tremendously since I was a kid. And I just wonder if you could comment on what you hear in Cash Valley or along the Los Angeles. Sure. Um, I, I actually don't find Cash Valley to have a, a um, super strong dialect, although I've met individuals who do. But I think you're right. I think because of media, because of television, um, the dialects have become a little more generalized nationwide. There are still some pockets. Where I come from, we speak very differently. They don't sound like me. I've gotten rid of most of it, but not all of it. My mother still calls H2O water, you know? Um, uh, so, uh, but as far as Utah is concerned, I actually have a hard time writing a Utah dialect. I've tried it before, and it tends to sound a little cliche I put a lot of dangs and, and oh, my hex in there, you know. Um, so it's not particularly honest. And, and as a writer, I want to be honest. So that's why I tend to write uh, in the voices of, of people from the places that I know really well. Um, and it sounds, to my ears, it sounds more interesting when I, I write a specific voice as opposed to a general common voice, you know. So it's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Advise your students who enter this arena that is very um, difficult, very competitive, and has not a whole lot of security. Sure. Um, and for them to continue to have faith in themselves and also in their skills and in their talent, their passion and their beliefs when every day is a struggle to get the yeah. next job or the next. Well, you know, that, that's, a, that's a really great question. Um, interestingly enough, uh, I was recently looking at some statistics about unemployment rates. And although I do not pretend that actors are highly employable, um, but people in the, in the entertainment industry are actually doing fairly well. Um, when I say fairly well, they're about average among in industries. They're above quite a few IT uh, jobs in terms of um, their employment rates and things like that. But I think what you're uh, talking about primarily is it really does take um, fortitude to stay in this industry. But there are jobs. If you have that, if you stay in it, you will be employed and you will have a career. Um, because the people who don't have the endurance to do it, they tend to go off and do other industries. But the thing that's unique is theater actually prepares you to be very good at a lot of skills that work in other industries. You're very good at working with people. You're very good at communicating yourself, problem solving. I mean, I will come to a meeting and someone will say, here's the problem that we've never faced before. We need to figure out a creative way to do this. And we just brainstorm. So that's really a foundation of art in general. So people who start off learning about the arts they tend to get into entry-level positions and work themselves up quickly because they have those skills. Um, everyone that I went to school with is employed. I would say half of them are employed in the theater or entertainment industry, and half of them are doing even better in other industries because that was more suitable to them. So, great question. I saw over here, yeah. Well, first of all, I haven't done an actual Broadway yet, but off-Broadway I have done. And in case anyone knows, Broadway nowadays is largely sort of Disney type. It's these big, large budget things. Most of the new works that are emerging out of New York go to what's called off-Broadway, a lot of the great plays. Um, the way you do it is you, you send in the script via certain avenues. 
Certain companies might ask for submissions. Um, other times you do it through connections. So if you work with someone who has a close relationship with the company, you say, can you pass the script on to them? Um, so for instance, when we took um, Do Not Hit Golf Balls into Mexico, for, it was just a staged reading, but we did that at Urban Stages, they had a competition uh, for new plays, and they selected, I don't know, about five nationwide to be finalists for what's called the MetLife, um, oh no, I'm sorry, that's a different one. It's, it's called the Urban Stages Emerging Playwright Award, and, um, and so that play was one of those plays that was selected. So that's, that's one of the ways. And eventually, if you want, you can get an agent, and they'll start submitting it. So I don't use that right now because they get a big chunk of the, the income, and so I'm, uh, I, that doesn't work for me right now. But eventually, I might have to. So we'll see. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. You work as a designer. How do you start? Does the director come to you with a vision, or do they come to you with a blank slate? And how much input do you actually yeah. get? It depends on the director. And there have been a few circumstances where I sat down at a first meeting and a director handed me a drawing, which I hand right back. Um, I try to do it in a very nice way. Um, but, if the, but if the director shows up with a drawing of the set, then they don't really need me to be there. They can just have someone who can execute the set. Um, and frankly, they're wasting the money on me. They could just save that money and, and put it somewhere else because I'm not actually designing it. Um, my preference is that we, we meet together for the first time with nothing. We have no images, we have no research. We just talk about the play. We talk about what it's about, what's important in the play. And uh, then I go off and I do my research and I come back with some rough ideas. Usually it's in the form of sketches. Um, sometimes it's in the form of a rough model uh, or something along those lines. And that's pretty much where it goes. And then the director might look at it and say, ah, I need more of this or, or that or the other thing. And so the best situation is very collaborative back and forth. And the costume and the lighting designers are also involved. Uh, the only people who really don't have a voice in it are the actors. Um, on occasion, an actor will come up to a designer and start to talk design. But the protocol is actually for an actor to talk to the director and then the director to talk to the designers about their design. Otherwise, it becomes really hard to manage. So yeah. About your students in the Kennedy Center. Oh, um, one, one great uh, uh, thing that we, we can tell, I guess, here amongst friends, um, our designers have had a long history of success in what's called the uh, Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival. Uh, each year, there, is, there are eight festivals uh, nationwide, and we're in uh, a region that includes all of Southern California, which is a really good region for theater. Uh, as you can imagine, Los Angeles and San Diego, uh, Arizona, Utah, Nevada, Hawaii, and Guam. I've never met anyone from Guam, but evidently they're in, they're in our region. And um, our students go down, and uh, Utah State students have actually won more what's called national awards than any other university in the region. In a, um, in a five-year period, we sent 14 students to the Kennedy Center, which is the award. If you win, you're, you actually go to Washington, D.C., and you work with these great Broadway designers. And uh, we sent 14 people. During that five-year span, I think 28 people were sent from the entire region. 14 of them were from Utah State. So our students do very, very well, um, which we're fortunate we have a graduate program in design, so that, that helps. But uh, so do a lot of the other programs. So. Um, yeah, and they get to go and, and, and work with the best. So it's a pretty big deal for them. Yeah. I really was fascinated by your story of Mrs. Bruner. Yeah. Affected you somehow. Yeah. Were there other um, teachers along the way or other individuals that helped you along your path you know, to reach your passion? Um, yeah, you know, uh, obviously I didn't enter college and say, hmm, I think I'll try theater. I mean, it's something that, that I had been doing since I was a child. I was very upset in fourth grade when for the first time I didn't get to play Santa Claus. Um, this other boy beat me out. I had been Santa Claus in kindergarten and in first grade and second grade and third grade. And uh, fourth grade came along and uh, they gave the role of Santa Claus to this other, other kid and I was frankly pretty upset. So. I think that maybe that motivated me to try a little harder next year. 
And so the next year I got to play Rudolph. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and you know, I had various artists and, and theater teachers growing up that really had a profound effect. I never, um, I actually was interested in acting when I was 11 or 12, but when I went to high school, I was encouraged, because I did visual art as well, I was encouraged to try set design. So uh, certain teachers that I had there really sort of pushed me in that direction as well. So that's been a good thing for me. So, thanks. Yeah? Obviously, you're very passionate. If you had to choose between writing and design. <laughs> Um, no, I, I, love, I love both, but there's an incredible sense of freedom in playwriting because uh, when you're designing, which I love as well, you are starting with a finished piece of literature and you're starting with a team of people. And I do love the collaborative element, but as a playwright, you're just as collaborative, it just comes later in the process. So you start on your own writing what, what you feel passionate about and then hopefully other people will, will join in your passion and they'll come on board. And there's something really special about sitting there in the theater when you're doing your first rehearsal. And um, out of respect to the director, you know, I sit back and just sort of let the director direct the actors. But every once in a while, they'll turn and say, Sean, you're the playwright. What do you think of this? And I love being able to have that voice and say, you know, explain where a character came from and what the incentive was and the motivation was, and then see an actor transform themselves into this role. So yeah, I, it's, the playwriting is really special to me. But the, most, m the bulk of my time is actually spent in the design tech area as a professor. Um, I would say it's about 60-40. Any other questions? Yes? So this goes back to Mm -hmm. So I was I, I, I going back to that the last death of the last year. Why why was the playwright why do you the playwright trying to control the response? Okay, so the, the the question is about the play How to Make a Rope Swing. There are two deaths that are alluded to in the play, neither of which happened on stage. One one happened fifty years earlier. It was the wife of the character that I just read. Um, and by the way, you, you find out partway through the play that the woman, Mrs. Wright, the other character, um, who's about to, to, who's very ill and is probably not going to be around much, much longer, you find out that she was involved in uh, uh, the suspicious events that led to, to Bo's wife's death 50 years earlier during desegregation. Um, but then there's a second death, and that is, I'm giving it away, but hopefully that's okay. I don't think it's going to be... That's okay. That's okay. I don't think it's going to be produced here in Utah again anytime soon. But you have uh, the character of Bo who passes away at the end of the play off, off stage. Um, to me, it was about, about the character sort of coming full circle. Um, he was so devoted to his wife uh, that he couldn't, uh, he couldn't allow his life to end until he had an understanding about what really happened to his wife and until somehow he could find peace with those events. And, and by, by spending time with Mrs. Wright, he was able to sort of understand what these final moments were. And, and at that point, there was nothing left. But you know, he's a religious man. He talks throughout the play about his faith and, and various things. The assumption is that he is intending to, to see his wife finally again after 50 years and to sort of come full circle with his devotion to his wife. So that's really what that was all about. And, and the play is largely about looking towards the future. And to me, one of the ways to look towards the future is to, to bring the focus back to the younger character who wasn't the main character, um, where you can sort of see uh, that perhaps um, with each generation, small steps are being made in one way or another. I don't know if that answered your question, but good. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Sean Fisher. Thank you. <laughs> As you can see, we, we value the arts, we value the cross-training, the, the value the arts brings into all of our other colleges. 
it's an incredible opportunity to have someone like Sean on the faculty, and an incredible opportunity for the training of our graduate students and undergraduates as they go through Utah State University. Sean, wonderful presentation. Join us uh, in April, April 18th, I believe it is, right, Celia, when, when we have Susanna French here. It will be a great presentation, I promise you. And we also have uh, some gifts on your chairs there, a, 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 a calendar for you to take home. Uh, and for those of you interested, we'll try to get word to you as, as to productions that we put on. Craig, maybe we can get a crossover of mailing lists there and at least get an in, invitation out to you. Thank you all. We'll see you in April.